Hello and welcome to the Psych Summaries podcast. My name is Hannah and I will be having conversations with clinicians, academics and experts that have applications to the field of psychology and mental health. They have many years of experience, meaning they are trusted voices in niche subjects. But I invite you to consume the content with a critical perspective since a one-size-fits-all approach rarely applies to mental health. I hope you learn something and enjoy listening. Today I'm chatting to neuroscientist and psychologist Shane O'Mara, who focuses his research on activity levels and the benefits on our mental health, cognition and memory. Specifically though, he looks at walking And I think this applies to most people, particularly as throughout the pandemic, it will have been our main source of physical activity. So welcome, Shane. Please, could you introduce yourself to listeners? Hi, and thanks for the invite to come and speak with you today. I'm delighted to do so. There's a message that we need to spread so (laughs) every opportunity we can take. So I'm, as you've said, Shane O'Mara. I'm Professor of Experimental Brain Research at Trinity College Dublin. I did psychology as an undergraduate, and then subsequently I did neuroscience for a PhD at the University of Oxford. And then I moved back to Ireland in the 90s. It seems like not just a, a, a different century, but an entirely different age ago. And I've always been interested in trying to understand the brain systems that are involved in learning, memory, and how they're affected by stress and depression. And that kind of naturally brings in other themes to do with physical activity impact on brain function. Did I always want to do this? I think, unfortunately, the answer is yes. (laughs) Ever since I was a, a young kid, I always loved to read particular books on science. And somehow or other, I've I found a path through that has worked for me. That's so great. I love that you've always wanted to do it. It's so remarkable and a real testament to your character that you've actually, you know, followed through. I mean, I feel like I change my mind every single day on what I want to do. So I think that's really incredible. Can we discuss what walking or physical exercise consistently will do to your body over time? Yeah, so I think there's a a couple of levels that you can answer such a question at. And one way I like to think about it is is from the inside out, what happens inside your body, inside your brain. And the other is from the outside in, what effect being out and about in the world has on you. So in terms of of actually getting up and moving, both of us are sitting at the moment, which is not the best (laughs) necessarily thing to do, although we, we both might be engaged in active sitting. So I'm not using the chair back for support. So that's good. And what happens is when you stand up, everything changes in your body compared to the quiescent seated state. So brain rhythms that were formerly absent suddenly become apparent. Your senses are sharpened, your blood pressure changes, and you start to mobilize factors in in the blood that are anti-inflammatory. So they drive down the, the level of inflammation and you process your blood sugars a little bit better, all of those kinds of things. So our bodies are designed for regular active challenge and we're unusual as a a species so if you look at chimpanzees or if you look at at the great apes they sit around 16 hours a day or something like that they don't move very much and it doesn't have really bad effects on their heart they've evolved to profit from that particular niche whereas we humans actually have bodies and brains that are built to profit from movement if you look and this has been done in really some detail just in the last couple of weeks a lovely paper has come out on this If you look at people who are living kind of quote unquote ancestral lifestyles and you look at how active their lifestyles are compared to ours, they do spend a lot of time sitting around, but they sit around on chairs that don't have chair backs. So they engage in active sitting. They hunker. So they sit down on their feet. So there's always some sort of muscle activity, but they also walk stupendous amounts. So they, they will typically walk somewhere between if you're a, a male of the order of between 20 and 40,000 steps a day, day in, day out, from about the age of eight or nine, all the way up into your late 70s. And cardiac health in these people is astonishing, as you can imagine. In one such population, the average cardiac health of an 80-year-old male is the equivalent of a 55-year-old sedentary Westerner. So 
we should move. We should move a lot more than we do, and we will get a lot of benefits from it. Okay, so if we are moving more frequently and we're walking more often, can we hear what is actually happening on a biological level in our bodies and how that translates into our brain? If you're engaging in lots of regular movement, you're enhancing your own aerobic capacity. And that's good for your heart, which is in turn good for your brain. Now, how does that work? Well, one of the things that you're doing is you're slightly increasing the pressure within your blood vessels. So that stretches them a bit. And the blood vessels respond to that by producing molecules that make them a little bit more elastic. That makes it a little less likely you're going to have a heart attack. And, you know, all the, the public health messaging we have is correct. We do need to get up and we do need to move more. So just thinking about the, the uh, effects of movement on you, let's take a specific example because you could talk about lots and lots of things. One of the, I think, wonderful discoveries over the past decade has been that our muscles, when they're actively engaged in movement, produce molecules which are called myokines. And there are at least 40 of these have been discovered over the, the, the past decade. These myokines are only produced in response to activity. So you must be actually working your muscles. And they float freely through the, the, uh, the blood system, the vasculature, and they help to repair organs. They help to repair stresses and strains. And they help to do things like combat inflammation and inflammatory factors that you might find floating freely around in the blood. They'll help regulate your blood sugar levels to get those down to, to more normal levels. And it's in these kinds of ways that physical activity really has a profound impact on your body. The good news is they also diffuse into the brain <laughs> and they have effects in the brain. And it also turns out from physical activity that some factors are produced in the brain that also help build fabric of the brain. So I'll give you a, a very simple example. There's a, a wonderful study conducted in Chicago by Art Kramer and his group a number of years ago. And what they did was they took a large group of people in their late 60s and early 70s, sedentary, and they divided them randomly into two groups. One group were assigned a physiotherapist who brought them out on a with another person for a walk three times a week of about a mile and a half or something, some duration like that. The other group sat at home. They had social interaction, but they didn't have the, the physical activity intervention. And over the course of a year, what you saw is really quite remarkable. The volume of the hippocampal formation, which is this part of the brain that's concerned with learning and memory, increased. Their memory scores got better. Their attentional scores got better. And a molecule which goes by the, the name of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, was found to be expressed at much higher levels in their blood compared to the people who are sedentary. These are really quite wonderful effects. But if you think about it a little bit further, the effect of physical intervention was obviously psychologically good for them. It was good for them where learning and memory is concerned. But it also shifts backward the aging of their brain a little. So that a 72 year old who has had lots and lots of exercise is showing brain function that will be more similar to somebody who might be 70. In other words, it slows down the aging of the brain. And actually, you know, when you say it like that, it's almost surprising, but we know that chronological age and biological age aren't the same thing. Some people age very badly and some people age very well. The people who age very well look after themselves. They get lots of exercise. They don't smoke. Have regular contact with others and all, and all of those kinds of things. So it's for all of those kinds of reasons. And there will be many more we will discover over the coming years. Walking is particularly accessible, you see. This is the, the key point, especially as we age. You know, nobody should be playing rugby <laughs> in their 60s. It's probably not a good idea to be playing squash in your 70s. There are cardiovascular risks and other risks with certain sports. But walking, consistently practiced, day in, day out, is possibly the most accessible and easily adaptable form of exercise we can engage in. In the actual act of walking, how many muscle groups are engaged? So that's, that's a, a great question, and the answer is known. So if you're seated and you have to stand, you have to engage virtually every muscle group in order to maintain an upright posture. But the reality is that if you're engaging in standard walking, the degree of engagement depends on where along the body axis you look. 
So your arms might not be engaged at all because they can hang freely at your side. All the muscles in your legs will be actively engaged and the muscles, of course, of the lower back. And then you have muscles that are concerned with posture and stability, which are required also to, to maintain an upright. But the truth is you're not putting much strain on those. You're not get, engaging in much activity with those. If you're not carrying something, if you're not doing something else. This, I suppose, is one of the paradoxes of walking, that you have one set of muscle groups in your legs that are working away very well, and other muscles aren't being particularly worked at all. But we're designed to carry things, we're designed to throw things, we're designed to do a whole lot of other things. So if you're concerned about getting upper body workouts during walking, engage in Nordic walking, which is this walking with poles. And the, the evidence there is that Nordic walking gives you about a 25% increase in cardiac activity. And there's a whole lot of other bits and pieces to, to the, the various studies that have been done on this. But if, if you do it and you've never done it before, you'll know you've done it because your shoulders and arms are going to be sore. It takes a while to adapt to it, but it is a very, very good form of walking. And especially if, you know, if you're a little bit frail and you're worried about falling, having two good lightweight sticks to walk with will really be a big boost to you as, as you're moving along. Yeah, it helps balance you out and just, I guess, yeah. gives you that confidence, doesn't it? That you're, yeah. if, if you do lose your balance, then you, you might not fall. But if you don't do that, if you are just engaging in walking, that's still going to provide you masses of benefits, right? It depends what you're looking for, okay? So if, if what you're looking for is a, a boost to cardiac health from walking, what you need to be walking at is a speed at which it's difficult for you to maintain a conversation with another person. So for me, that's around 6.2 kims per hour. For somebody else, that might be four Depends on, on your age, your state of health, uh, your stride length and a whole lot of other things like that. OK, but that's helpful because that's something you can measure, even if you're walking on your own. If you try and just talk yeah. to yourself, if you're losing your breath yeah. and you know you're walking faster. Yeah. Yeah, or you can't sing to the, pod, <laughs> to the songs that you're listening to or whatever. <laughs> Over time, if you're not engaging in physical activity and let's take for this example, walking, does your functioning whether that's brain or overall muscular or cardiovascular health does that all deplete yes is the straight answer unfortunately it, it's we have bodies that are designed to be worked and we can show this very easily there's a, a fantastic study which was conducted by uh, some physiologists in france a few years ago and they took healthy males in their late 20s these were sporting males and they put them in a, what's known as a waterbed where they're protected and so they don't have any effect of gravity or much of an effect of gravity on their bodies and they kept them in this these conditions for three days and measured limb function pre and post and what they showed in these healthy specimens and this is the, the key thing that uh, there was a decrease in muscle mass an increase in muscle fat and there were other issues to do with the muscles in terms of the of the ability of the muscle to show what's called viscoelasticity so you can deform it and then it reforms its its shape and they did all sorts of other things to them but literally three days was enough to to show this in healthy young males and this is why frailty in the elderly especially those who are in hospitals for a long time is such a major problem we need activity even if it's just activity in the bed where the, the physio has you working some weights or whatever it happens to be but we do need lots and lots of regular activity wow that's scary isn't it healthy males three days i mean if you just think about yeah. going on holiday and lying by a pool <laughs> if you're not <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, I guess I've never seen the attraction of that, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're by a pool, you might be more likely to swim. So they're probably. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it does go to show that if you are, I mean, even if you get the flu, that's going to impact your. Oh, yeah. Regardless. Yeah. The good news is that, you know, we can recover from these things. So we just need to change what we're doing. Get moving. Basically. Yeah. It goes both ways. It's not yeah. it's not once you've stopped, you can't come back from it. It's You just yeah. have to try and keep consistent. So I know that you mentioned briefly about the memory and cognition benefits. I know that you're a neuroscientist. This is why I want to pick your brains, because in the research, what areas of the brain are significantly active when you're exercising? Does that cause growth in those areas? And how does the brain change over time if you are active? 
Yeah, so I think the truth is that act, act, activity, especially, you know, when you're engaged in activity with other humans, so you have to think about what others are doing, causes changes in activity right throughout the brain. So let, let's take the, a very simple example, and then we can make it a little bit more complicated. I'm currently seated. So if I decide I want to go and walk to the shop uh, across the road, that means I have to form an intention to do it. I have to formulate a, a kind of a cognitive map of where I am and where the shop is. And then I have to get up and move. So that means the command signal has to come from somewhere in the brain to say stand. So that will come from the frontal lobes. Typically, I have to remember where the shop is. So that's a kind of hippocampal and other parts of the brain that are concerned with cognitive mapping and, and memory. And then I actually have to entrain movement, so I must move. So the motor areas of the brain get together and they fire off a motor program that will allow me to walk down the stairs, out the front door, and all of that kind of thing. So there's lots of activity happening in, in lots of the brain. And then when you're moving, if parts of the brain are concerned with postural stability, so you need to be able to stand and stand upright. Uh, you don't want to be falling over. If you slip a little because, I don't know, maybe it's slightly icy out or something like that, you have to recover your upright stance. And you have to say hello to your neighbours if you meet, if you know them and you meet them. And so suddenly you're bringing in the social brain. So lots and lots of different brain areas are active during the course of this kind of movement. And as you've already kind of said or kind of hinted at, our brains and our bodies are, are designed for and profit from movement. So the more we engage them, whether it's socially or physically or whatever it happens to be, the better off those regions of the brain are. What you'll see if you do connectivity studies, for example, is that parts of the brain that are concerned with memory would become, quote unquote, functionally more connected with other parts of the brain that are concerned with maybe movement or with, with uh, social functions or, or things like this. In a, a really important sense, you know, movement activity drives activity all over the brain. And the very fact that we're moving changes activity right around the brain. So, for example, if you're given a visual detection task where you have to kind of pick out a flickering stimulus, which is kind of hard to see. If you do that seated, your performance will be perhaps OK. But if you do it when you're up and moving, your performance is enhanced. And this is because our brains are particularly designed to have movement feedback onto early sensory regions and enhance the activity of those regions. So your hearing becomes a little bit sharper, your vision becomes a little bit sharper, your sense of touch and all of those kinds of things become a, a little bit sharper through the very act of moving. Wow, that's insane just walking can do all of these things I mean it, it does make you think wow what's sitting doing to all of those things it's just stunting, <laughs> it's stunting. <laughs> yeah we we need to sit less and get up and move more and I and I, I think you know that when you look at the the literature on this sitting per se is not necessarily a bad thing you know uh, we have to conserve energy we're designed to find energy and then hold on to it and Going back quickly to the hippocampus, I know that's associated with memory. So does that infer that there's a causal link between physical exercise and improvement of memory? Yes. Yeah, no, it, 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 this is difficult to do in humans, but it has been done in, in small animals like rats where you can put them on exercise wheels and you can keep them in the lab for a couple of years. And uh, you can look at one group that are exercised every day on, on running wheels versus a group that sit at home in their home cages eating uh, whatever. <laughs> rat treats are available and then you can test their memory you know those kinds of things very easy studies to do and what you see is the ones who exercise have lean bodies they have much healthier brains and their learning and memory is much enhanced compared to uh, those that uh, that don't but there are active intervention studies in humans the one that i described by art kramer is a very good example of that where you recruit people who of, a, of you know a certain age and then you impose an exercise regime on them and a study we did actually a few years ago we did something similar t with college students who were sedentary and we had one group who came into the lab and did a really unpleasant hour a day on an exercise bike <laughs> and uh, another group that didn't that just uh, sat around and then we were able to show even in in a healthy group of young college students that you could get enhancements in learning and memory and an increase in brain derived neurotrophic factor in their bloods compared to the group that were sedentary. Wow that's honestly so fascinating. 
In terms of applying what we know so far then to the field of mental health specifically, what is the research saying? What appears to be coming out is, I think, a, a really, really important finding, which is that people who are more active, physically active, are much less likely to succumb, in particular, to major depressive disorder. The World Health Organization has labelled uh, correctly depression as, as the coming plague of the in the mental health sphere over the coming decade. And the numbers of cases are rising everywhere we look. And I, the correlation between the cases going up and the sedentary lifestyles that people have is, is, is a really interesting one. It may not be causal, but what we do know is that when you track people in, in terms of the amount of activity that they engage in, and you do this over a long period of time, like a decade or more, what you see is that the chance of becoming depressed falls for every level of activity that you engage in above the most sedentary. So it's like a vaccine against depression. And it, what we don't know is how effective it is against other kinds of, of conditions. It doesn't, for example, the, the data don't look especially compelling where anxiety is concerned. And this may be because the, you know we need to distinguish between trait anxiety and state anxiety. You know, we're all a lot more anxious at the moment because of the state we're in. Um, you know, we, we're having to wash our hands many, many times a day. We have to wear masks. Uh, all, you know, you and I couldn't meet face to face indoors in an enclosed environment like we could have done. At another point in time, meeting for a coffee would be perfectly reasonable. So we are more anxious because of what's going on. And that's actually a good thing. If you didn't have that underlying anxiety, you wouldn't be taking health precautions and you would die. So, you know, yeah. we've been selected for anxiety where that's concerned. Now, where other conditions are concerned, the general claim to make is that what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So if you're maintaining good heart health, you're going to, by definition, maintain good brain health. Quite a few strands of evidence are pointing in a, in a direction which I think is really, really important and has been overlooked. So the, one of the big conditions that's going to hit us, not over the next 10 years, but over the next 40 or 50 years, is Alzheimer's disease and dementia. The data are showing in a very compelling way, again, the more active you are, the healthier your heart is, the less likely you are to get Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So physical activity has a really important role to play, not just in, in kind of acting against depression, but also against other quote unquote neurological illnesses like Alzheimer's disease. So again, if we can build in active living and active movement into people's lives right throughout the lifespan, it will have a huge impact on how people age as they hit those kind of critical years that you're likely to uh, succumb to something like Alzheimer's disease. Mm, and it's so important to consider those conditions because once you've developed it, then you can't turn it's back It's too hard. late. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Prevention is better than cure. <laughs> Absolutely. And I do think that's really at where psychology as a discipline falls down, perhaps, because we tend to look at treating disorders rather than preventing the onset of them. Public health is always the kind of the, the poor relation here. You know, uh, when you look at all the money that goes into, for example, treatment of cancer, which I, I don't object to, mm. uh, but many of the cases that we've got, could, might never have happened had we had adequate public health measures to ensure that people don't smoke, they're not export, exposed to carcinogens in the environment, all of those kinds of things. My next question was actually to ask whether 10,000 steps is enough. Let me add a little subtlety to the 10,000 steps okay. thing. Because we've got a lot of data now on movement, and we have it principally because people are, have mobile phones, and we can measure steps in, in all sorts of ways. The average Westerner is walking around about four and a half to 5,000 steps a day. There's a bit of variation. The Japanese walk the most, on average, about six and a half thousand steps a day. Saudi Arabians walk probably the least at around three and a half thousand steps a day because they don't have a walking infrastructure. There are no footpaths in Riyadh, apparently. Now, if you look at the relationship between walking and health, it looks like there's a threshold of movement somewhere around about north of 4,000 steps. So if you're engaging in a minimum of 4,000 steps, your chances of dying in the next year fall and fall quite a bit. The chances of dying fall even more the more activity you engage in. 
So my advice always is, whatever you're doing, add about 5,000 steps more than you're actually doing. Because if you're an average Westerner, you're only walking around about 4,500 steps a day. That still only brings you up to 9,500, which is fine, by the way. <laughs> and do you need to do that walking in one chunk? That's a great question. And, and the answer is we don't know in fine-grained detail. My surmise is, and I think there, there's data from people who go to gyms who, who sit around all day and then try and work off the effect of, of sitting around all day in the gym in the evening. And uh, that doesn't work. Right. Uh, so my sense is that what you should be doing is getting in around about 10,000 steps or more per day, but it should be distributed in, in some chunks through the course of the day some morning, some mid-morning, some afternoon, some evening. And during the course of the day, get up and move around regularly. Every 20 minutes, if you're seated at your laptop, just stand up and then sit down again, if that's all you can do. But you can do that. Instead of mind wandering at your laptop or looking at, I don't know, Facebook or whatever, just get up and go for a walk up and down the room, or the room that you're in, or up and down the stairs, if you have stairs or whatever. But just get some movement in regularly. Just don't sit there accumulating lots and lots of, of seated hours. So for someone working a nine to five job that says I don't actually have the time, what you're saying is you small movements and just moving yeah. your body. Regularly, really yeah. Really Even if it's just active seating, stretching, doing things like that, moving about, but get up out of your seat. You know, you, you do have the chance to do that. And, the, you know, there are our possibilities, people are time poor. There's no doubt about that. And it, it, it's a lot to put on people to say you have to move more. I think this is where an outside in perspective is useful. If you look at how we've designed our environment, we've designed movement out. So in the building that I would normally work in pre pandemic, when you go into the building to get to my office, which is up on the third floor, the lift is in front of you. So the default is the lift to get to the stairs. I have to walk through three sets of fire doors. Baked into our environment are designs that take away movement. You're in London. I've been to, to London many times. If you, mm. if you look at people coming out of the, the tube, you've got a set of stairs and you've got an escalator. You've got free exercise on the stairs. No <laughs> one take the escalator. is using those Nobody stairs. takes the stairs. Yeah. Uh, and this is because we're designed to conserve energy. We live in an energy rich environment. There's food everywhere. We don't have problems getting access to food anymore unlike, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago or whatever it was. But design choices by architects and engineers make a huge difference to how much movement we can actually engage in. If, you, if you're old, you've got a walking impairment, you're on a stick or you're using a frame or something like this. If the footpaths are designed so you can't step down easily, well, then you're going to be trapped by the design of the environment, not by your motivation. So we, we really need to think about how we can change the environment so we move more. It's quite sad, actually, thinking that the environment that we are all living in is not necessarily one that supports our optimal health. Maybe the idea behind escalators and things like that is to support those that cannot walk. But unfortunately, we all default to it. Uh, you know, yeah. my local train station, there's a you can run this experiment as well. There's a an escalator and a stairs. Uh, and I always try to take the stairs. But you know, if you watch one. people, <laughs> I'm one of the very few <laughs> that will do it. But this, but this is a key point, you know, you've just brought up there. How we design our environment has a huge effect on how we behave. You know, if, if the streetscape is safe, if people have got wide footpaths, if cars are segregated from pedestrians, if there's lots of green in the environment, make it a, a kind of a, a restful environment to walk around it. People will be more active in those environments. Whereas, you know, if you take the... I guess the M40 Westway, to, to take a London example, who wants to live on the side of that and who would walk on the edge of it? Nobody. Whereas you've got wonderful parks in the centre of London, like Green Park, they're full of people strolling. Yeah. You know, so the, how we design the environment has a huge effect on how people end up moving just by default. It is interesting. I mean, my daily walk at the moment, I try and get out every day to get my movement in, but there's hardly any green in that. And sometimes I think, well, does the level of fumes, because I'm in the city, outweigh the positives of walking? Really good question. And 
I think we know generally there's a lot of air pollution around. We've taken out some fraction of the pollution, you know, so there's no lead in petrol anymore. But there's lots of particulate matter. We're using diesel cars, which are a bit dirtier than, than petrol cars. And there's particulate matter off tires, which people have forgotten about. A study came out last year from Washington State in the US showing that salmon spawning in rivers is very badly affected by tire runoff into those rivers. We, we don't think about the silent killers that are in our, our uh, broader environment. And London, no more than Dublin, has thankfully clean air legislation. So you don't have those old pea soup fogs anymore because people aren't burning dirty coal anymore. That's had a, a profound effect on respiratory health. But we need to keep working at this. And as you say, in the environment you're in, you must widen the footpaths. You must bring in cycleways. You must make it easier for people to get around on their own steam. You must improve access to buses, all that kind of thing. It's a shame, really. It feels like we only respond when it's kind of too late I've I've seen so much work on cycle lanes now in London but that's due to them not wanting people to commute because they don't want people to get the virus but it's not because oh actually we want you to be active and we're going to try and make that easier for you yeah exactly the same phenomenon here the the coastal road along the train that I take into work when the pandemic hit the the local councils suddenly thought it's a great idea let's take out a lane of traffic and uh, put in uh, cycleways and they're fabulous. I cycle them. I love them. But it took this pandemic to make that happen. And that's a real, real shame. Hopefully at some point we will be living in more cities like Amsterdam where the environment actually both permits and promotes more active levels. Have you got any research on why people don't incorporate physical activity even though they know it's good for them I mean I was thinking about the case of smoking there when we <clears throat> have a packet which actually says this is going to give you a disease but yet people still smoke so we're told that walking and physical activity is good for us do we know why people can't put that into practice yeah yeah uh, we do and overcoming it is, is, is going to be hard so in a nutshell, the, the reason that people don't put it into practice is very straightforward. We evolved in a calorie poor environment where conservation of energy was really, really important. So if you were migrating on the African plains, you didn't have a constant source of food. We hadn't invented agriculture. You couldn't expend more than a certain number of calories per day without restoring those calories or you would die. So we, we have this need to capture calories. It's built into how we are constructed as humans. It's perfectly reasonable that that is the case. On the other hand, we have this need for movement. So there's a tension between these two things. Humans are subject to these kind of non-conscious forces. We grew up, as I said, in a calorie poor environment. So you were always worried about not having a food source tomorrow. That is not something that afflicts us in the Western world now. We have food everywhere. But this kind of old evolutionary bias is there and it's there for very, very good reasons because we were subject to privation through our, our history. People were selected for those who were good at capturing calories and storing them and all of the rest of it. So it's those two tendencies that we have to fight. And this is why public health policy has such a, a, a problem in trying to get people to uh, have a balanced diet because our biases are for things that are salty sweet and fatty <laughs> uh, for very, very good reasons. You know, they're calorie dense and we love them. You know, why do people love salted caramel so much? If it was calorie poor, we wouldn't have a selection in favour of it, but uh, we do. Yeah, so it's really not the fault of our individual self that we are drawn to. No, and we shouldn't blame people for this. It, it's really easy to say you should have more willpower. But, you know, if you're poor, you're time poor, you don't have a lot of money, you know, you can get a rich, dense source of calories for a few quid down the chipper. And that's not healthy for you in the long run, but in the short run, it's better than not eating at all. So it's really easy to wag the finger at people who are in these situations, but actually it's not fair and it's not right. And if anybody else was in that situation, you would find yourself making the same kinds of choices because you have this kind of immediacy and immediate problem of, of dealing with how do I get calories now so that I don't die tomorrow? 
And if you've got a family to feed, then that's obviously yeah. going to be your biggest and most important reason for opting for that fast food. If you've got children to feed, yeah. food to put on the table, then that's that's going to outweigh the other factors that come into this. I would love to know whether being inactive or the opposite, being a very healthy, active person, actually changes your personality over time. Yeah, so the, there's a little bit of data on this. Now, the data are longitudinal data <laughs> and they're subject to all of the kind of caveats that you have. But So the, there's a, a fantastic study has been done in uh, the USA tracking people in terms of personality change and looking at how the factors of personality change as a result of your levels of activity. So I'm going to add a caveat at the end, but I'll, I'll just tell you that the bottom line result is straightforward. Okay. Uh, that what you find is that lower levels of activity show declines in openness. So people are less open to experience. They become less extroverted and they become less agreeable. So th these factors of personality to do with with interaction with others and, and social living all kind of diminish. Now, what we don't know, as this study hasn't been done, is if we were to take people who have shown this d decline and then you were to impose an activity regime on them, would you reverse that out? My suspicion is that you would, that, you know, our social abilities are honed by interactions with others. And when you're being physically active, you're more likely to go for a walk with another person or you can meet people at the gym or however it is that you do it, play a team sport. Whereas if you're sitting on the couch, you'll find that these capacities are, are diminished. So at the moment, what we have is that evidence showing that these social factors diminish over time. And what I'd love to see would be an, in, uh, an interventional study to see that if you get people moving again, do they come back up again? On the back of that, thinking about the social factors, is there quite convincing evidence that discusses the difference between walking alone and walking with people that are your friends and people you love? So we, we don't know is, the, is again the, is the honest answer. Now, again, just think about walking as an evolved phenomenon. Humans conquered the planet by walking together. We didn't do it by walking alone. One guy with a spear isn't going to conquer the world. Whereas a tribe, a family group will, because uh, you've got males and females, you've got capacity for reproduction, you've got all of those kinds of things. So at our core, walking is an evolved social phenomenon. We're very, very good at walking together. And we're really exquisitely attuned to others when we're walking. So, you know, if you see people walking and one person throws their head to one side because they've seen something, others will do the same. So we're, we're watching each other when we're walking without even realizing it. You know, one person is vigilant, we all become vigilant. And humans do something that's really unique. Chimpanzees do not get together to protest in, and walk in lockstep against something they don't like just doesn't happen. Whereas humans, you know, you, you had the, the, the example in London two years ago, the anti-Brexit march, where I think it was a half a million or three quarters of a million people turned up and walked together. This is like, you know, something that is not a feature of any other species. We walk together to register our protest against something we don't like. What we don't like is not the fact that we're not being fed or whatever it happens to be. It's to do with our social relations with others. That's what we're protesting about. And, and what you find in, in those kinds of circumstances is that people register a, a decrease in the boundary between self and other. They feel like they become part of the crowd. There's a kind of a, a blurring of the edges of, of your self and other. And, and, and people feel like they're at one with the crowd. And this brings with it feelings of well-being and it, it brings with it feelings of enduring positive emotional memories. I was there that day. We didn't overturn Brexit, but by God, I still feel good that we did it. That kind of thing. And, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm just choosing Brexit because it's a salient example. Mm. But, it, you know, people march for all sorts of reasons. And when we say march, what we're actually meaning is we walk together in unison protesting against X, whatever X happens to be. Yeah, it's actually very powerful, isn't it? Being part of a community and yeah, it, it, it's really a, a, a remarkable phenomenon, and it, it, it's it's uh, one that really does set us apart. You know, 
like other species fight over territory, other species kill each other, other species do all sorts of things like the things that we do. But but this walking together to protest <laughs> against something we don't like, you know, chimpanzees aren't walking in protest against the uh, the gods of the the jungle because there there haven't been enough uh, fruits this year. It just doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. It does illustrate the unique character and tendencies that humans have. So last question, I would really love to know whether you think that incorporating walking and counting those steps could potentially be more detrimental to the benefits that we actually gain from the walking in the first place. Another downfall that humans have is to become very obsessive. And it, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier with the anxiety which helps us clean our hands. I mean, I hope that it doesn't mean that we develop more OCD tendencies and things like that. But can there be a cost to over tracking our walking behavior, do you think? I I I can give you a kind of a a complicated answer, which is that we have data on people's self-report of their own walking. And what it turns out is that people are utterly unreliable. So if I asked you how many steps you took last Thursday week, you will not know. Your body and brain are not designed to record the, uh, the number of steps that you engage in. And people substantially underestimate the amount of physical activity that they engage in. They will over-report it sometimes. They say, oh, yes, I get out. But you can show that they don't. But when you you do these diary studies of of people's reporting of the amount of activity that they engage in, they're really, really poor. So I track my steps every day. I, I don't feel obsessed by it, but I do look, you know, four or five times a day to see where I'm at. And if I've gotten to two o'clock, and I've only done 2,000 steps, I think that's a catastrophe. And I will be going out f- for a walk to make that up. So I, I think, as, as in all things, moderation is a good thing. But I think tracking the amount of steps that you engage in is, is a perfectly reasonable thing because we're not designed to remember the number of steps we engage in. And then you can see what your activity patterns are like through time. You know, you can turn it on and ignore it. And you will be surprised by how little you walk without this nudge and I, I think it's a great nudge or prod to to get people moving more than they would otherwise have done yeah that's really interesting actually I think you know we tend to demonize these things don't we and trackers fitbits and things like that but actually they can just be there as a reminder a nudge like yeah just- and a prompt basically and, and and that's what I use mine for so I I don't wear a fitbit I just you know use the tracker on my phone I check that a few times a day, and if it's north of 14,000 steps, I'm yay. And if it's uh, below 4,000, I'm <laughs> so <laughs> mortified is right. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for the incredible insights that you have provided. I am definitely thinking that I would like to try Nordic walking. But for anyone listening and who wants to learn more, and particularly, I think you have a newsletter. So would you be able to share or direct people to your page? Yeah, so uh, you could go to my sign up for my regular newsletter. Tomorrow's newsletter will concern urban walking. And that's at brainpizza.substack.com. Or else you can look me up at shaneomara.com. But uh, ideally, sign up for the newsletter and see what you think. Well, I mean, I can imagine people will want to because this is so fascinating. I think it's a real draw, the neuroscience behind it. And I think people really do get drawn to the evidence base of this stuff. So I'm sure people will be really interested. Well, thank you so much for your time and for answering all of the questions. Maybe in the future we can have another chat. I'd be very happy to. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Shane. 
Thanks for listening to today's podcast with Shane O'Mara. If you enjoyed the episode, then please head to his website and sign up to his weekly newsletter, which I will link in the information. If you do want to keep up with Psych Summaries, please also subscribe to this channel as well as leaving feedback and following the page on Instagram at Psych Summaries. I really hope you enjoyed this topic. There will be plenty more on this soon. See you next time.